This whole session is about community uh, and today I've invited um, three speakers and I'm going to play one video and I'm going to make a short speech myself but it's about solution focused practice community and arguably with two politicians in the mix politics um, I have no idea what the two politicians are going to say I have a pretty good idea what Mark's going to say um, and I'm fairly sure I know what I'm going to say uh, and if you're all good to go then I'm without further ado I'm going to begin my speech and then I'm going to introduce each of the speakers with a one sentence introduction and all of their bios are in the brochure which is available on the Padlet. Okay, here we go. So welcome everybody to Solution Focused Practice and Community. Now, I'm a therapist and I have been for a quarter of a century. I have tens of thousands of hours of clinical practice behind me, but my heart lies in community and trying to develop communities. Not with great initiatives or fanfares, but working quietly, connecting people, helping them to develop their own ways of being and supporting them as best I can. I've always been an advocate for small steps. Even before I came across solution-focused practice, I was never satisfied with the formal training I received. From an engineer's point of view, which I was before I retrained, wallowing in problem rather than seeking solutions didn't make sense. When I was introduced to solution-focused practice by Susie Curtis, I was skeptical. Today, I consider myself to be an advocate not for a static set in aspect type of therapy as so many therapies before have become, but for something that is continually evolving, developing and helping the world to focus on possibility rather than problem. It is to my great regret that I never met Steve DeShazer or Insu Kimberg. I often wonder if I had had the privilege to meet them and to debate the future, what kind of conversation that would have been. However, Speculation is pointless and harmless, harmful. So I plow my own furrow in the hope that what I'm doing will benefit more people than it will harm. This is the kind of approach and torch that I can take from what I have already read about Stephen Insu. If something works, I will do more of it. If it doesn't work, I will do something else. I see solution focused practice evolving and developing into new areas and with new ideas every day. I know there are those who continue to say that solution-focused therapy should remain predominantly as a therapy, but it is spreading out into far more spheres of activity as its influence grows. But it is not the only option. It is not the only way. Furthermore, and even more importantly, solution-focused practice by its very nature is inclusive, not exclusive. Today, I brought together some experiences in the ex experts in their own lives who have brought, sought to build communities from the bottom up rather than impose a top-down approach by importing and imposing experts upon communities. Three of the people speaking today were not aware of solution-focused practice, but yet there are similarities in their approach to that of SSP. All of us here today believe in the strength and resources of the person or the people that we are working with. We trust our clients and the communities we work with to help them exploit those qualities for their own benefit and that of others. There is the long-term, this is the long-term and sustainable approach. Today, I hope that in a small way, we can begin to build new bridges and bring the structured nature of the solution-focused practice to new people and create new opportunities for sustainability and, for most, and most of all, for a better future for the planet and all the life upon it. We are not hoping to build back better we are hoping to build forward better. No longer can we continue with a hunter-gatherer economy that deliberately and systematically wastes resources as part of its process. We have to consider the possibility of there being a different way of thinking. The time has come to change the focus of the world from problem to possibility. There are many clues that this is happening. People are beginning to change the way they think from fear to hope. I hope that this conference in some small way will help to raise awareness across the globe that our leaders cannot continue in competition, but begin to emphasize community, cooperation, and collaboration. 
Solution focused practice explicitly includes cooperation and collaboration. We assume ability and capacity in those with whom we are working. We assume that our clients have hopes for the future and we work with them to help them notice and take small steps towards their future. We don't empower them. We don't even enable them. We help them to notice possibility. All four of the other speakers in this plenary have tried to do this in their own way. And through this panel, I am reaching out to them and to their colleagues to attempt to build links, possibility for collaboration, and most of all, hope for a preferred future. Thank you. That's my bit. What I'd like to do now is to share my screen and a video from Cormac Russell, who is one of the founder people of the Asset Bates Community Development Programme. Um, it's a fascinating uh, program. He's all recently written a book called uh, Rekindling Democracy. Um, it's a fabulous book. The question, can I help you, is a question that millions of people ask millions of other people every single day. What does it actually mean to help another human being or indeed to um, help an entire community? I believe that helping is a powerful and often beautiful human impulse. But I also believe that helping has a shadow side. That certain styles or forms of helping are actually doing more harm than good. Rosabeth Moss Cantor, the Harvard academic, puts it beautifully when she says that when we do change to people, they experience it as violence. But when people do change for themselves, they experience it as liberation. Today, I want to present a very simple idea. And the idea is this. If we want to help people in a way that does no harm to them and their capacities and their communities, then the best place to start is with what is strong within them and within their communities, and not with what's wrong. There is an abundance of evidence that calls us to this way of helping including the 75-year study on what makes happiness possible, the longitudinal study from Harvard, which reminds us that it's best to lean into our relationships and to create community rather than lean into ourselves and money. And the work of the Kettering Foundation, which studies what happens when democracies work as they should. And indeed, here in the UK, the work of the New Economics Foundation, which has helped us to see the five ways to well-being. Still, despite the fact that thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence call us to the idea that we should start with the capacities and the abilities in people and in communities, we see this great preponderance in <laughs> governmental and non-governmental programs alike around the focus and the obsession with the starting on what is wrong, what is broken, what is pathological within people. Sadly, that focus has caused huge harm to millions of people around the world, especially poor people and especially communities. And it has created four harms, unintended as they may be in particular. The first of whom... Steve, we've lost the sound. Perhaps you should unmute yourself. It's when some Sorry, Mark, can you not hear right it? Program ...and the right money comes in to rescue them. Big programs alike. No, Steve, there's lots of people saying they can't hear it. Including right. myself. Okay, hang on a second. I do apologise. It did come back then, Steve, but it's gone off again. It's 
we can hear it when you are unmuted. It, we uh, stopped hearing it when you muted yourself uh, about a minute ago. Ah, uh, right, okay. Um, I'll tell you what then, I'll just leave my mute off and do it that way. Around yes, it's not a bandwidth with issue. With the starting on what is wrong, what is broken, what is pathological within people. Sadly, that focus has caused huge harm to millions of people around the world, especially poor people and especially communities. And it has created four harms, unintended as they may be in particular. The first of which is, it actually takes people who we're trying to help and it defines them not by their gifts and their capacities and what they can bring to the solution, but by their deficiencies and their problems. The second unintended consequence of this top-down obsession with what's wrong is that money, which is intended to go to those who need the help, doesn't. It actually goes to those who are... Oh, shit. We can still hear you, Steve. Those who are paid to provide the services to those who need help. The third unintended consequence is that active citizenship, the power to take action and to respond at the grassroots level, retreats in the face of ever-increasing technocracy, professionalism, and expertise. And finally, entire neighborhoods, entire communities that have been defined as deficient start to internalize that map and believe that the only way that anything is going to change for them is when some outside expert with the right program and the right money comes in to rescue them. These are unintended harms. No caring professional wants these things to happen. But it's also clear that no community needs these things to happen. Fortunately, there's another way of thinking about helping. We can begin to actually reflect on a form of helping which starts with a focus on what's strong, not what's wrong, and literally turns our traditional ideas of helping inside out. John McKnight and Jody Kretzman, two professors at Northwestern University in the late 80s, brought this idea into sharp focus when they spent over four years traveling almost like an odyssey across 300 neighborhoods in North America, some 20 cities. And as they went into these neighborhoods, which were largely known by others as backwaters of pathology, known by the sum of their problems, John and Jody started a different conversation. They invited people to tell them stories about how change happens from their point of view. They invited people to share stories about a time that they and their neighbors came together to make things better. And the stories they shared, some 3,000 stories in all across that four years, share, well, they brought a focus. They brought a, a way of seeing what actually is used by citizens and by people in neighborhoods to create change. They helped us to see the raw ingredients that people use to make change happen from inside out. These are the six building blocks that those communities set are the building blocks that make change happen when it's sustainable and it's endurable and it respects the assets that exist already in communities. Over the last 30 years, we've traveled across the world and from communities in Tallahassee in the USA to Torbay in the UK, we have heard the exact same report from the mouths of indigenous communities people telling us that these are the assets that must be identified, connected, and mobilized if we're going to see real change happen in our world. Imagine what would happen if our traditional ways of helping people were flipped. If instead of focusing on what was wrong with individuals and indeed with entire communities, we started with a focus on what's wrong. And then we figured out how to negotiate a new relationship, a more respectful relationship. I think what would happen is that we would see transformation in a way that we could never have imagined. Fortunately, it's already happening. We're doing some work and we've had the privilege of coming alongside some community builders in Leeds. Leeds is a city, as you know, in the UK. And over the years, we've trained a number of community builders to the city council, but also in the neighborhood networks. In Leeds, one of the things they care deeply about is 
how older people can live well and age well close to home, and also how they can ensure that those that are aging do not die with an experience of loneliness and feelings of uselessness. I'm going to stop that there because you've got the gist of his ideas and he goes on to describe a number of other um, uh, examples of projects that he's been involved with. Um, and what I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce Sir Peter Bottomley, um, who is the father of the House of uh, Houses of Parliament in the United Kingdom. Um, is, and that means he's the longest serving MP in the House. Um, he's been in politics all his life. He's been incredibly involved in um, community politics um, and has had many, many initiatives from all sorts of different places. And I think I don't need to say anything else other than to say, Sir Peter, would you like to offer us your thoughts, please? Thank you. And don't look on this as this organized TED type talk. I'm going to say a number of things which are related in my mind, but may not appear to be in yours. And I'll obviously speak from a, a UK, a British, English perspective and my own experiences. Uh, the first thing I normally do with any group is to ask, when will the colour of my skin be as important as the colour of my eyes or the colour of my hair? So I'm not defined by how people see me. And we don't know the answer to that question yet. A man called Dr. Richard Stone, who is a Jewish human rights activist, said too often we ask the victims or the vulnerable to put things right. Those who are white, middle class, male and full time jobs have the greatest power and influence and we need to be involved. We don't need to take the whole responsibility. And here I would call in aid a man called John Adair, who in about 1973 published a book called Action Centered Leadership, where he talked about having to work in the overlap of three circles, achieving tasks, building teams, and developing individuals. I'd also mention a man called Bob Holman, H-O-L-M-A-N. And if you look him up with a profile by Dave Wiles, you'll see how he was a professor of social administration who actually got going family centers, children centers. Uh, before I became a member of parliament, I was chairman of an organization, social work organization called the Church of England Children's Society. We had a hundred social work projects and a thousand social work staff, lots of volunteers as well. We took on Bob Holman's pioneering work and put a semi-trained social worker in a spare flat in a big uh, estate where about eight children a year were taken into care. They became children of the state because their parents couldn't cope. And by the social worker, just having mothers in, normally mothers, sometimes fathers, normally mothers, to do their washing together, have coffee together, talk together, the authorities began to have confidence in the families and the number of children taken into care was cut by three quarters. Just giving people the confidence and the competence to achieve things. If you then come onto projects, when my wife and I first set up home of our own in South London, we asked the young boys who kept breaking into our house and into our cars, why? They said, there's nowhere to, I said, why do you go and play football? They said, where can we play football? Within five minutes walk was an area with corrugated iron around it, protected by the council. It was going to be part of the redevelopment plan in five, 10, 15, 25 years time. So I said to the council, this is following an initiative in Goldbourne in Kensington, uh, where the first neighborhood council was set up, in effect, a city parish council. Let's have our own. Let's tell the council we want some wheelbarrows, some pickaxes, some shovels. We created two football pitches, and that led to the development of a park, and we used local people. That was my first community initiative. As a member of parliament, I start saying to myself, why is it that some families come to me saying, we don't want our child to go to a particular secondary school? It's not very good. How do you make it good? And the answer is use the existing people if you can. And that's where I reinforce what people say about systems can change, people don't. People change things, systems don't. Now, both those generalizations, it's not completely true. People can change and systems can do good. But in general, making an existing system work better 
is better than trying to change the system when you then have the teething problems and you delay the improvements you want. What are the purposes of politics, public life? Uh, the Greek would say the good society. I say reducing avoidable disadvantage, distress and handicap and improving well-being, a mixture of wealth and welfare. And I won't get into avoiding unnecessary international war or civil war. I will say in a community, if something's missing, how can it be developed? If something exists which is good, how can it spread? And how can you allow those who have the lived experience to be able to contribute? They may need to have their confidence and competence increased, and that increase may come from themselves, but it can also come by people who can act as a community telephone exchange. And in our system, with single-member constituencies, I represent uh, about 75,000 voters, about 100,000 people altogether, including children, I can normally connect people and get things to develop and to happen. And I could take you through my present constituency of Worthing West and show you where ordinary people doing ordinary things often have made a fantastic difference. I can't talk about therapies, and I don't often talk about solutions, but I do talk about what is needed for a task to be achieved and who is the person who has the levers. And the lever is often the person at a local level, they may be a school governor, they may be a teacher, if you can back the people in charge, you can normally get the community to come in together. I'm not a leader, I'm a follower, and I follow some very good people. And if I give one tip to those of you involved in public and political service like me, if something's worked well, never expect or ask for the credit, because people will trust you far more if they don't think you're in it for yourself. I stop. Thank you, Peter. That's really interesting expedition, uh, exposition. Thank you very much. Book, by the way, is ex mayor of Salford, ex MP for Eccles, um, and has done a huge amount of work um, in communities in and around Salford, which is a city in its own right. I've been very clearly told today. Okay, my name is Ian Stewart. Uh, I am presented as a deceased politician masquerading as an academic. I'm a former trade union officer, former member of the UK Parliament. For the former directly elected executive mayor of the city of Salford, I'm currently a researcher at the University of Bolton Institute of Management. I am speaking today in a personal capacity as a political practitioner, and my subject is establishing a citizen-led collaborative social partnership model. Right, Steve? In social partnership, which is a European uh, Commission concept, there are three levels. There's the macro level, which is the EU uh, model of country, state, and even interstate partnerships. There's no example of that due to time restrictions. There's the meso level, which can be a city or a town. I have a case history with a hypothetical local authority council town partnership model. And the micro level, that's a single community or company, organisation or entity. And I have a case history uh, about the Valley Estate, a housing, so housing estate in Salford social partnership from 1997. So what does social partnership offer? Well, social partnership can offer a collaborative, sustainable alternative to the traditional top-down adversarial approach to bargaining and negotiation. What can social uh, partnerships do? Well, the sort of objectives it can have is to identify and jointly agree sustainable solutions to problems and challenges and to generate collective action. The sort of goals that social partnership can help achieve is to achieve sustainable outcomes for the common social good, creating self-sustaining people, organisations and communities, what I call the SPOC model. Case history one. That's the MESO model. That's the a, a UK local authority. It's a mythical um, paper that I did uh, in 2018. So it's not real. It's a suggestion. And that was to encourage a redesign away from a traditional UK local authority top down bilateral approach to civic governance and social engagement. Steve? Oh, sorry. Um, what sort of observations, recommendations and suggestions come out of this general approach? 
Uh, the implementation of what I term as a polyhelical social partnership model for building trust relations and identifying and implementing agreed challenges and solutions. The Council was in, would be encouraged to establish a public debate and dialogue about these matters, adopt an integrated social partnership approach, adopt an overt cooperative Council profile, establish a citizen informed and led social engagement strategy and establish a town-wide social partnership standing committee and structure. Steve. The Council will also uh, encourage to establish a digital rolling master plan, a continuous online public consultation process, which could feed in to that rolling master plan, an integrated new theme for the town or city, a thinkers, makers and doers collab, the Council to establish a town learning partnership, town wide learning partnership, a town digital innovation hub, an escalator business model and a town employment standards model. The case history uh, number two is relating to a micro social partnership, which is a real social partnership, which was implemented in my constituency in Salford in 1997, and it relates to a single housing estate. The original motivation was for me as a new politician, I wanted to observe local impact of government policy implementation. Steve, the first steps that I took as a politician were to identify communities of interest, one being this housing estate, the Valley Estate, then to establish a partnership which was citizen-led so that they could identify the problems and challenges, and of course, the good things that had actually happened. Uh, and of course, bring together the meeting of partners. The sort of problems that the residents identified were unfortunately all too standard for today, intimidation, drugs, vandalism, burglary, and other matters. Some example outcomes, and I've only got time to give one or two, from this project, this partnership, was that the residents wanted um, people who walked around the estate and assisted with these matters. And we developed the concept of police community service officers, which is a cross between police and social and community workers. This went on to become UK legislation. Uh, Another level was a single organisation called Helping Hands, a per handy person service uh, that meant that residents were trained to use the equipment owned and provided by the council to improve their own environment. Now, in reflecting on these outcomes, the questions arose in my mind, are they sustainable solutions? The answer I would say is yes. Are they transferable solutions? The answer in my mind is yes. Could they be improved? The answer to that is definitely yes. Now, did any of these solutions, these outcomes, inform government legislation and other communities? The concept and model of police community service officers, as I said, were adopted into UK law and are, there are more than 10,000 across the country of these police community service officers. And the concept and model of helping hands has been informally adopted and adapted by many communities across the UK. So the conclusion to this short presentation is that outcomes from the Valley Estate resident-led social partnership are still in existence 30 years on. And this has led, I believe, towards self-sustaining people, organisations and a community. The SPOC model, as I've termed it. This approach has provided a platform for the residents in this community to deal with change in a positive and collaborative way. So finally, the question is, is this a panacea to um, generate citizen-led solutions? No, it isn't. It is only one model. It is a model that can be successful. It may or may not be appropriate in other communities and in other countries, but it is part of the contribution that trusts local people to know what they need, and it is part of the solution
to get servants of the people, politicians and agencies and support agencies to actually do what they're supposed to do, and that is serve the people and to help facilitate that, uh, those solutions and the, more, the structures upon which they can be made sustainable. I hope that this has been food for thought. I'm happy to answer any more detailed questions in the question and answer session. And I will, of course, be happy to participate in a much deeper discussion about these issues and other uh, case histories that I have uh, surrounding social partnership and uh, civic governance and social engagement. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. That's excellent. Thank you very much. And if I can introduce Mark, because we are very tight for time. Um, Mark McCurgo, well known in the solution, solution focused community, um, book writer of many books, um, presenter of many things, um, insp inspiration of mine, I have to say, um, and one I turn to regularly for help. I think he needs little more introduction. Um, so if you'd like to kick off, Mark, we'd be delighted to hear what you've got to say. Thank you very much, Stephen. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am a management and leadership consultant masquerading as a community builder, uh, to pick up from Ian's definition of himself. Uh, I've got 30 years background in uh, manage it, management and leadership. I learned solution focus and applied it as one of the first to apply it, along with Paul Z to coaching and organizational change and uh, since been very involved in the solution-focused world. And last year, in the beginning of the lockdown, I observed that my street here in Edinburgh began communicating in a very different way. There was a street email group set up by Jenny, who's also on the call. There was a WhatsApp group. People started telling each, supporting each other, telling each other about where, where you could get food, where, how you could get stuff delivered, what shops were open, and so on and so on. Uh, and immediately the community sprang into life. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I'd like more of this. So I started to think about how could we build more, build on that that was happening already. And so I started an initiative called Village in the City. And I've just put the link in the chat. Village in the City is about encouraging people to build micro local communities wherever they are and of course we can't do it for them but we can give them resources we can give them support and we can put them in touch with other people around the world who are trying to do the same thing and i think listening to ian's uh, macro miso uh, and micro this is micro micro probably because it's it's at the level of streets neighborhoods uh, you can walk across it in 10 minutes sort of level of level of locality uh, and of course, there are millions of those around the world. I can't possibly build them all, but I can encourage and support people to do that. And I wrote a manifesto at that time of six things I think you need for a successful micro local community. And you can read all about that on the website. But very briefly, they are connection and communication. Uh, you need hosts to bring people together. You need meeting places for them to come together. You need uh, inclusivity for it to be for everybody. You need inclusive events. And finally, you need to build a positive identity about why we're slightly proud to be here and in this place. Uh, and we've got member communities in North and South America, across Europe, and recently in Asia as well, as well as in the UK, although it's still a very young initiative. And the reason I think that solution focus, uh, which as Paul has been talking about in the chat, is a very badly named thing we're not about solving problems we are about building towards better and i think this is uh, i'd like to put three things forward that i think are important in the big picture that connect solution focused practice with community building and they link very much to some of the things that have already been said perhaps in slightly different language the first one is the value of building towards better rather than trying to fix the past and that doesn't sound like much of a difference, but actually it makes all the difference. Uh, how you engage people in a conversation, not about intimidation and drug abuse and the other things that Ian put in his example, but to get them starting to think about a community where those things didn't matter or didn't happen. And how could we build 
out forward towards a community where intimidation and drug abuse were not a problem, uh, rather than trying to fix those things. The second thing is about putting the real citizens at the heart of the action. And uh, we've heard this in various ways today, uh, built by the citizens of the community for themselves, perhaps with a bit of help from outside people. But uh, echoing what Cormac Russell was saying earlier on, I think that this uh, professionals coming in to fix things in the end doesn't help as much as, it, as we'd like it to because when the professionals leave, the initiative stop, the funding stops, and the problems kind of have a nasty way of starting again. If you put the people in the community in the driving seat and give them a little support, uh, this may well, uh, th this will continue, the citizens continue, the residents continue. Uh, and it's not primarily, I think, about money. This is not a thing that needs massive funding. It's a thing that needs taking people seriously and people feeling that their thoughts and, and desires and hopes about their local, uh, their local places, very local places, uh, are important and are being slightly listened to. And also they have the freedom to go out and start to do things like the WhatsApp group in our street, like our neighborhood Facebook group, who, which has built from 20 people to 1100 over the, uh, over the last year. Uh, these things don't need official sanction, but they need they need listening to and they need supporting and they need uh, they need to, uh, being taken seriously. And finally, picking up on Cormac Russell's uh, thing about starting with what's strong, not with what's wrong. That's a very solution focused idea as well. This finding what what is working in the community, what is there in terms of skills, gifts, passions resources that people can bring into the picture and thinking about how we can build on that and use those things to build, start to build forward in small steps. That's another key thing about solution focused practice. With great enthusiasts for small steps towards better as opposed to big plans to trying to fix what's, uh, what's wrong. Uh, so, uh, and in that regard, um, these six aspects, I hope these six aspects of a community, uh, my, my six aspects in the manifesto, offer six quite simple things that people can begin to see what's working already, build towards a little bit in building them and improving them a little more. Um, and very often uh, in actual communities, like here in the West End of Edinburgh, where I live, we're quite strong in some of them, but we're very weak in others. And so that offers us a, a good balanced way of starting to move uh, to move forward. So I think there's a great partnership to be had between solution focused practice, asset based community development, taking people seriously and taking local citizens seriously and treating things on a very, very local basis, even more local than than local government units of wards and things like that. So I'd like to uh, applaud everyone who's you know, spoken today and hope that we can perhaps continue these discussions in some way uh, and bring people's experience together uh, to help real improvements for real lives in real neighbourhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have less than a minute of our time left, um, which is a remarkable um, coincidence. Um, I also would like to add my thanks to Mark's uh, for it to Ian Stewart, Sir Peter Bottomley, um, and to Mark himself, and to Cormac for allowing me to use the video. Um, it's been, I'm sorry we haven't had an opportunity for a discussion, but I'm absolutely delighted that we've had the opportunity to do this. I will be putting the, the recording up on the, um, uh, on the website in due course, and hopefully we can have further discussions and further thoughts. Uh, I noticed that Paul has been putting some very interesting comments in the chat, um, which is really, really good. Those are all saved and they can also be put into the watch party when the time comes. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'm sorry you haven't had a chance to ask, ask questions of our speakers, um, but I hope that you've had some food for thought uh, and I look forward to further discussions. So thank you all very much indeed, because I know you know, know you all want to rush off to the next series of plenary sessions from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Thank you very much all for attending. And thank you, Steve. Oh, Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everybody. Bye now.